And once again, I want to welcome everybody to the Florida Friendly Landscaping Professional Webinar Series. Today's webinar is Residential Landscape Management with Dr. A.J. Reisinger. He'll provide an update on landscape maintenance practices that impact our water quality. Um, turn that off. This webinar is approved for one FNGLA, Florida Water Star, LAIF, DBPR, and FDAC CEU. Um, while the webinar is free, there is a $10 administration fee to receive a CEU certificate. I'll put that link in the chat box a little later. Um, and um, we will be submitting the CEUs to the licensing agency by, um, by Friday at the very latest. So give me a few days to make sure everybody's had a chance to make the payment, and then we'll go ahead and process those CEUs. This this webinar is part of a monthly webinar series that we hold on the second Tuesday of every month at 10 a.m. Our next webinar will be New Landscape Pest with Dr. Adam Dale. And something else to keep in mind is that your microphones have been muted. So please put your questions into the chat box and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. Also, you'll see a survey invitation pop up. And please take a moment to fill that out. Um, it really helps us determine what educational programs to offer and if we are meeting your educational needs. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn the um, stage over to Tom Wickman to introduce today's speaker. Claire, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Tom Wickman. I'm the statewide coordinator for the Green Industries Best Management Practices Program. I'm also the assistant director for the FFL program. And it's my pleasure to get to introduce our speaker today. Dr. A.J. Reisinger is an assistant professor of urban soil and water quality and specializes in ecosystem ecology and biogeochemistry of urban environments. He's a member of the Sustainability, Human, and Ecological Development Group. He focuses on the ecosystem functions of nutrient and energy cycling and the effect of traditional and novel contaminants on these functions. Dr. Reisinger received his PhD from the University of Notre Dame. Today, AJ will provide an update on landscape maintenance practices that impact water quality. Without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. AJ Reisinger. Great, thanks Tom, thanks Claire for inviting me and thank you all for being here. <clears throat> um, I'm really excited to talk with you all about some of the work that we have going on that hopefully will contribute to how you all uh, are able to carry out your daily work as well. So the title of my talk today is a little bit uh, funny, a little bit of a joke, but it's called Digging Holes in People's Yards, uh, Quantifying Nitrogen Leaching from Residential Soils in Alachua County, Florida. I call it Digging Holes in People's Yards because literally uh, for this project, we went out and dug a bunch of really deep holes in people's yards and installed a bunch of samplers. Um, and now we're uh, reaping the benefits of that. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Before we get started, I want to acknowledge the individuals that have really allowed this or made this happen, this work happen. Um, this project wouldn't be possible without the many homeowner volunteers that have let us dig holes in their yard and have let us play in their landscapes. This work has been funded and kind of overseen by the Alachua County Environmental Protection Department, particularly headed up, uh, this project has been headed up by Shane Williams with insight from Stacey Greco as well. And Holly Greer really was helpful in getting the project started and finding our uh, volunteers at the homeowner level. I've had a whole army of technicians. I'm a assistant professor, state extension specialist. I'm too busy to be going out and sampling these yards all the time. So I have to uh, hire a bunch of really great undergrads and postgraduate students as well to, to do this work. So I'd like to highlight in particular Ansley Levine, who's been leading up the project for the past year, uh, Daniela Danielle, who kind of got the project started, and then a whole handful of additional uh, undergraduate students that have gone or have uh, worked uh, as technicians for pay for this project for the past two years. We've also gotten additional help off and on from a variety of people in the lab as well as from other labs. And like I said, the work was funded by Alachua County. We also had a, a top off funding from Florida Nursery Growers and Landscapes, Landscape Association. So that allowed us to hire additional uh, technician support. And finally, we've been working, we've been partnering with the Masters Lawn Care in the second year of the project to uh, make this work as real world, as applicable to your daily jobs as possible. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that um, a little bit later. Before we get into the project at all, I want to kind of focus on the why, why we're doing this, why we care. Um, at, at the 
big scale, at the big picture, we're thinking about urbanization. Urbanization is a global issue, a global threat to the environment and to natural resources. And you can see it's kind of, it's definitely a present concern throughout the entire United States. This is a night sky image of the US from a couple of years ago, sourced from NASA. But you can see all of the kind of clustering of lights that are associated with major urban areas. Like here we have Chicago, we have the uh, Acela Corridor, we have DC area, we have Atlanta, et cetera, right? Um, and so that's urbanization overall, but urbanization has a myriad of different impacts on the environment and on our daily lives. One thing that we're gonna talk about particularly today is the expansion of residential landscapes. So this is a map from a paper that's about seven years old now, I guess, that shows the uh, percent coverage of turf grass throughout the United States. And so the greener areas have more turf grass. If you kind of go back and forth between these two images, you'll basically see where there's lights, there's green area. So where there's cities, that's where we have turf grass lawns, especially in larger metropolitan areas with large suburban um, expanses as well. In fact, turf grass is, um, as of 2015 at least, and I believe it's probably even gotten, gotten more so, is the largest uh, irrigated crop grown in the United States by surface area. So there's more surface area of turf grass than any other irrigated crop throughout the country. This is particularly of concern uh, in Florida and the state of Florida. Um, Many of you have probably seen these figures before, but this is um, these are maps that were put together by the Florida 2070 project. On the left here, we're looking at what the land use was in the state in 2010, when there was about 18 million people living here in the state. Red are all the developed areas. Dark green are protected areas like the Everglades National Park, National Forest, that sort of thing. And then light green is everything else. It's agricultural land, it's rural land, it's barren land, et cetera. Um, and by 2022, we now have over 21 million people living in the state, and the projection is that by 2070, there will be 34 million people living here. So that's almost doubling our state population, um, and we need somewhere for those people to go, right? We need people want somewhere to live, um, and they probably don't want to continue to build higher and higher skyscrapers. So there's going to be an expansion of this uh, residential developed area, and you can see the projections are that Basically, all of peninsular Florida that isn't um, currently protected will be developed. There's some agricultural areas, some ranching areas, et cetera, that might not, but much of the state is projected to be developed. And if we look at the general percentages of what that means at this entire state level, it's projected that the state will move from 19% developed to 34% developed by 2070. And so this is what those houses look like, right? This is kind of the new normal. This is obviously, this is not Florida. This is literally just a Google image search that I, uh, I searched for uh, residential lawn, I think. And I think this is the first thing that came up. So I'm not saying that these are, these are Floridian houses, but this is the general idea that of what we see in a lot of new, new construction, new developments. You have a house, you have a uh, pretty decent sized patch of uh, lawn in the front of the house. You also have maybe a tree or two. You have some shrubs that are different levels of uh, um, different levels of difficulty to maintain. You probably have more uh, grass in the backyard as well. So this is kind of the new normal. Everybody wants their own little plot of land. They want their own little plot of grass and their own shrubs and trees. But we know also that this is not normal, right? This is not what the States land used to look like. Even if we were in grassland areas, a grassland does not have a really shortcut bright green grass with a shrub here or there and some tall trees. So we are changing the landscape, obviously, like there's no question about it, but then what does that do to the rest of the environment and how can we uh, minimize those impacts while maintaining the benefits we get from our landscapes? So one thing that I really think about a lot, or the thing that I think about the most is water quality. And in particular, I'm really interested in nutrients, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus in particular. And so there's been quite a bit of work that's uh, either directly or indirectly linked to urbanization with nutrient pollution in Florida waters, as well as in other parts of the country. This is a map from the Southwest Florida Water Management District's Springs Task Force Report. It's about 20 years out of date right now, but I just think it's such a cool figure that I, I love to share it. 
So uh, the red line here is the population growth curve of Hernando County. Um, and you can see that in 1960, it was uh, starting to increase in population and it really boomed between the 70s and the 90s and then started to kind of plateau off in 2000 or so. On the right, this darker line with the squares and the triangles, this is the actual nitrate concentration at the spring vent from Wikiwachi Springs. So this is a, a high tourist attraction springs area. It's really beautiful. It's a really fun place to go and swim and play for the day, right? Um, but it's really cool to see this basically mirror image pattern of the population growth curve. And then about 15 years later, 15 years lagging behind, you get this nitrate growth curve. Um, it's not definitive. It could just be some random correlation, but the, the clear combination of these patterns is quite compelling to me that shows that there is some relationship between population growth and nutrient pollution of the springs. On the right here, this is some more recent data that was co that's been collected and is continuing to be collected by a PhD student in my lab, Emily Taylor. And uh, what, what we're looking at here are six different streams in the greater Gainesville area. So moving from left to right, we're moving from a reference stream, Hatchet Creek, that's on St. John's River Water Management District Conservation Land area, um, all the way to the right to Sweetwater Branch, which is down below a wastewater treatment plant, and Tumblin Creek, which is uh, basically drains downtown Gainesville. <clears throat> so at the top, these are the nitrate concentrations in blue, and these figures are called violin plots. Basically, we have two years worth of biweekly data, so almost 100 data points. And all those data points are clustered or are represented by the shape of these violins. So this really short, fat one means there's a lot of data all clustered right here at about zero. This tall, skinny violin means there's a lot of data that's kind of spanning this entire area. So it's a lot more variable um, for nitrate concentrations at that site. What you can see is that nitrate is increasing with urbanization. It kind of peaks or plateaus at this wastewater treatment plant, which is not surprising. We're sampling directly below the effluent of a wastewater treatment plant. This is a specific con conductance. This is kind of the overall total number of ions dissolved in the water. And you see a similar pattern um, with a lot of variability at the treatment plant, but also an increase with urbanization. So we, we know that there is some relationship between urbanization and nutrients and nutrient pollution and other contaminants. But urbanization has a lot of different things going on. It's not just residential lawns, right? And so where is this nitrogen actually coming from? There's a model developed by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection called NSILT. I can't actually remember what that acronym stands for, so I apologize. <clears throat> but this NSILT model estimates a range of different nitrogen sources to groundwater fed systems. So it basically looks at all the different land uses in a spring shed or a watershed and assigns numbers to each land use. Like this land use will leach this much nitrogen into the groundwater. And this one will leach this much nitrogen. And then it kind of compiles all of that up to figure out how much of uh, each nutrient is coming from each source. What we see here is looking at two spring fed systems, Kings Bay in gray and Rainbow Springs in black. We see that there's a bunch of different sources and that actually urban fertilizers are not the dominant source for either of these systems. In fact, for Kings Bay, it's primarily septic tanks and for Rainbow Springs, it's kind of primarily livestock operations. But you do also see though that urban fertilizers are a non-trivial amount. They're 22 and 10% of the relative contribution for those two sites. So that's showing that if we can reduce the amount of nitrogen coming from urban fertilizers while also dealing with septic tanks and livestock operations and crop fertilizer and stormwater, we, we need to deal with all these issues, but urban fertilizer is one of these issues. Another approach that we can use to quantify where the nitrogen is coming from is actually taking a sample of the water and looking at its chemical properties to say how much uh, nitrogen is coming from where. So this is a paper from, this is from a paper from some colleagues uh, that used to work at the Gulf Coast Research and Education Center in uh, down near Tampa. And they found that in stormwater runoff in a Tampa Bay neighborhood, that about 60% of the nitrogen in that stormwater just came from the atmosphere. It was in the rain when it fell to the ground. About 30% came from ammonium-based fertilizers. 
10% from nitrate-based fertilizers and like less than 5% from natural soil sources. So again, this is another uh, line of evidence that says fertilizer might not be the, is not the only problem or the only source of nutrients, but it is one source of nutrients. But we also know that properly maintained healthy turf grass doesn't leach much nitrogen. So this is work that was done by a lot of the UF turf grass team, um, looking at how much nitrate leach from experimental test plots under highly controlled conditions. So at the top, this is 2006, 2007, and 2008. And each of these dots are how much nitrate leached from different experimental plots of St. Augustine grass fertilized with a wide range of different nutrient treatments. Um, I believe that the 12.5 kilograms and per hectare per year is equivalent to about five pounds per thousand square feet. So this is about our recommendation now. But you see basically after 90 days, so after about a three month establishment period in this first year, there's no nitrate leaching across the entire period of record. So really nothing was leaching even if we hit it with two, three, five times as much nitrogen as we would recommend. So that tells you that really properly maintained, healthy, well-irrigated, well-mowed turf grass, like we have in these experimental test plots, won't leach much nitrogen. And so that leads us to these to continued questions of can we, or how can we reduce fertilizer impacts? Um, we are currently in an FFL uh, webinar, so I think it would be kind of remiss to not bring up the third principle of FFL, which is fertilizer, fertilize appropriately, sorry for that typo. Um, and I would also point out that you should follow the other FFL principles as well, um, because right plant, right place, irrigating efficiently, all of those other principles will further improve your landscape health and theoretically reduce your fertilizer need as well. Another program that I'm a big fan of that hasn't really caught on in residential or urban areas, but is more focused in agricultural areas is the 4R Nutrient Stewardship Program. Um, and the four R's are right source, right rate, right place, and right time, right time and right place. So basically you wanna apply the right product. You wanna apply it at the rate needed for your crop, in our case, turf grass. You want to apply it when the plant needs it at the right time, but not before a big rain event, for example. And you want to apply it at the right place. So you want to get the nutrients where the plants need them. You don't want to uh, apply a bunch of nitrate or ammonium nitrate fertilizer or whatever product you have. You don't want to apply that on a bare soil patch if it's all, all the grass is dead already anyway, for example. <clears throat> Basically, what I'm working towards a big part of my career goals are we want to reduce inputs and increase efficiency of any chemical that we apply on the landscape. So use less, but get more out of it is kind of my goal. Are these measures effective? Well, one, one measure that we've kind of had to, well, I don't know about had to, one measure that regulatory officials have taken because voluntary efforts don't seem to be working are Florida fertilizer ordinances. I'm sure most, if not all of you are well aware of the ordinances and hopefully you're aware particularly of your local ordinance and you are following that ordinance. Um, I'm, I'm not here to be the ordinance police, but I just assume that professionals like this audience are definitely uh, aware of these regulatory issues. But I wanna talk a little bit about Florida fertilizers, right? They're very common statewide. This map, sorry, I should have pointed out, this map is from the FFL Florida Fertilizer Ordinance mobile app, mobile web application that you can go to and you can click on your county or your municipality and learn a little bit more about your ordinance. So it shows how common they are statewide. But also I should note that the timing and limitations of these ordinances are variable. Some locations, some areas have summer uh, ordinances that prohibit the application of nitrogen-based fertilizer during the wet season. Some have a winter dry season ban on nitrogen or phosphorus fertilizers. Some have non-seasonal bans associated with things like new landscapes or new construction or other management techniques. So there's a, a wide diversity of these ordinances and there's not really that, sorry, let me take a step back. There's not really much data out there. Um, I just kind of gave away my next step, but there's not very much data out there that actually shows how effective these ordinances are for water quality. Um, 
I've heard arguments from both sides, from the uh, environmental groups saying that our ordinances don't go far enough. And I've heard the arguments from the turf grass specialists that I work with on a daily basis saying, well, but if you apply nitrogen the right way to a healthy stand of turf, it's not going to leach anything. So I think there's, there's reason on both sides, but we haven't really had really strong data to support this either way yet. Until this paper that um, I'm co-author on along with a few colleagues in soil and water sciences department. Um, for this project, we actually, so this is an unpublished paper. It's currently in review. It's in the third round of review, so it'll hopefully be published fairly soon. But we looked at all of the Lake Watch long-term monitored lakes that are in areas with fertilizer ordinances. And we looked at how their water quality trends over long terms have changed between before and after the ordinance was implemented. So what you're looking at here is the four different types of categories we included. So lakes with no bans, lakes with a non-seasonal ban, a summer ban, or a winter ban influencing their, their watershed. And the blue here or green is the trend in water quality over time before the ordinance was in, ordinances were enacted. So moving from about 1985 through about 2010, um, but we took each lake uh, on an individual basis uh, because ordinances were enacted at different times of the year, or different years. And then on the gray, the gray over here on the right, this is the water quality trends after the ordinance was enacted. So you can see there's not, they're not like really huge increases or decreases. It's very subtle trends. But if you look here, no ban is maybe slightly going up. This is total phosphorus, mean annual concentration, by the way. Um, we have other analytes as well. But you see after the ban, no bans are still going up. Non-seasonal bans, it looks like a slight increase and then maybe a slight decrease, but not much change. Um, the summer ban is actually the one that had the most significant difference in that you had an increase over time. It doesn't look that significant, but it was um, an increase over time and then a decrease uh, after ordinances were implemented. So basically, these results do show that certain water quality parameters, phosphorus and nitrogen in particular, are benefited, benefit from uh, fertilizer ordinances, but different ordinances are have different levels of effectiveness. And I think another thing that isn't incorporated in these data is how well the ordinances are actually um, enforced or maintained or monitored. Um, I have a lot of conversations with professionals like who is probably in the audience who are very uh, strict about following these ordinances, but then they see their neighbor who's just a homeowner take out a 30 pound bag of 20% N and just apply that to their tiny little lawn because they think that's what they should do. Um, and so I think we still need some education and some enforcement of these uh, ordinances as well to really see how effective they could be. Other, other ideas or other options that we can look into for reducing our impacts is kind of changing our fertilizer approaches. So there's, uh, I'm sure most of you in the audience probably know this better than I do because I'm not a fertilizer specialist. Um, but there are a variety of different fertilizer options. There's the traditional old school synthetic fertilizer. It's water soluble. It's kind of like a candy bar for grass, right? If you feed it, feed it to the grass, it will be water soluble, will be quickly taken up by plants, but at the same time, it's also very likely to leach or to run off the landscape. It's also very energy intensive to make the synthetic fertilizer. There's slow release synthetic fertilizers that kind of take the traditional like ammonium nitrate based fertilizer or something and coat it with like a polymer coated urea or something like that. Who knows? Um, like I said, I'm probably talking out of out of my head here without knowing um, more about these fertilizers. So I apologize. But slow release synthetic fertilizers are designed to break down in the soil over time and slowly release the nutrients that they have uh, inside their capsules. There's also organic traditional fertilizers that are um, mineral-based fertilizers, but they're produced from biosolids. So you have biosolids that are then treated for various viruses and human health issues, and then converted into a traditional fertilizer form. Um, there's various examples throughout the state of different types of this traditional fertilizer option. 
Another thing that I think is gaining a lot of popularity uh, throughout the state from my per perspective is the use of compost as an alternative or uh, an additional tool for improving soil health. Compost top dressing is not a fertilizer exactly. It's more of an overall soil health amendment. And it's really cool because it repurposes waste materials, right? Like whatever went into the compost was already waste, was already trash, was already going to have some leaching or some nutrient inputs into the environment. But instead of having a leach in a landfill or discharging into a stream, you're taking those nutrients and repurposing them and using them to promote soil health, promote a healthy microbial community and provide some fertility as well. So I talk about these different fertilizer options because these are some things that we're going to touch on a little bit later on. So uh, now that we're kind of through the, the overall big picture, let's boil down to what the heck I actually do. Um, so for this, this presentation, the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about a project that we've had going since the spring of 2019. Um, we, like I said earlier, we know that turf grass, when it's really well maintained and healthy, it can absorb a lot of nitrogen and it won't really leach many nutrients uh, to the groundwater. But in 2019, Alachua County came to me and said, okay, so we know that about really well-maintained experimental test plots. What about the real world? Um, this is a picture on the left. These are both real world pictures, but the right looks a lot closer to what my yard looks like than the left. Um, and I actually have a, I, I think it's a pretty nice yard, but it's not, it's not perfect. And I think that's more common, more uh, normal out in the, in the real world of Florida. So for this project, we uh, set out to answer these two questions. How much nitrogen leaches from a typical residential landscape in Alachua County? And that was the first year of the project. And then we had to take a year off because of COVID. Um, and in year two, which was actually the third overall year, but we'll call it year two because we had to take a year off, we asked how do different fertilizer approaches affect nitrogen leaching? And so today I'm going to tell you uh, the rest of the study design and objectives, talk about our methods and how we went about addressing these questions, and then uh, go through some preliminary results and summarize. So this is a cartoon of all the ways that nitrogen can move across a urban or residential landscape. The green arrows are inputs. So you have things like pet waste, compost, uh, biological fixation, fertilizer applications, deposition, then the blue arrows are outputs. So you have harvesting of biomass that's collecting grass clippings and taking them off site. You have denitrification. So that's a microbial process that converts nitrates to nitrogen gas. And then you have leaching, residential output. I'm not exactly sure what that is. I think that might be human waste. And then storm drain uh, export. So today we're primarily gonna focus on nutrient leaching because uh, this project was, like I said, funded by Alachua County and was particularly interested in the spring sensitive areas of the Western part of the county. So in year one, we wanted to look at nutrient leaching from turf grass lawns and mulch beds. We installed isometers at about 20 locations and collected samples about weekly um, from those lysimeters. And for this project, we found uh, residents that were willing to participate, willing to let us dig holes in their yard. But we also told the residents, we don't want you to change anything that you're doing. If you typically hire a landscape professional to fertilize your lawn, keep doing it. If you typically do it yourself, keep doing it. If you don't do anything, keep doing that. We basically wanted to get a variety of different residents and different uh, landscape management practices to see how variable or how influential those uh, practices were. And then year two, which is still ongoing, I have a student out right now collecting samples, actually. Um, we manipulated nitrogen fertilizer approaches at the same yards at the turf grass lawns from year one. So we had 12 turf grass lawns and we had four treatments uh, in year two. So we had control lawns that got no nitrogen. So we basically asked, or we asked all of the people, all the participants at the beginning of year two to stop any nitrogen fertilizer applications, to call their uh, professionals if they partner with a professional or to do it themselves. But basically we wanted to say no nitrogen fertilizer from anywhere outside of the project. But for most of the lawns, we did apply a fertility treatment. And so that's why we were comfortable saying that. 
We did have three control lawns to see what happens if you don't add any nitrogen. We had three traditional lawns, which received a mineral fertilizer every two months. We had three organic lawns, which received a biosolids based mineral fertilizer every two months. And then we had comp compost top dressing lawns, um, which instead of a, a traditional bi-monthly fertilizer application, we did a compost top dressing at the beginning and end of the growing seasons. And I also will note that although we are in Alachua County that has a fertilizer uh, ban or fertilizer ordinance that prohibits applications from June through February, for this project, the, uh, the project was exempt from that uh, fertilizer ordinance because Alachua County wanted to see how effective that ordinance may or may not be. So they did allow uh, applications during the wet season and during the dry season. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. I also will point out that in the second year of the project, we added additional landscapes. We added reclaimed water yards to see if reclaimed water was a major source of nitrogen leaching uh, to the groundwater. And we also added natural areas to see how different a control turf grass lawn that's not getting any nitrogen, but it is still has residential soil quality. There's all kinds of other issues with uh, urban soils. And we wanted to see how natural areas might leach nutrients as opposed to residential areas. So at every location, we installed a lysimeter. A uh, lysimeter is basically, I don't know, I call it kind of like a reverse well. You dig a hole and you put, uh, put something down in that hole to collect water, a reservoir, and then you can pump that water out. So for our project, we dug a four foot hole because we had a three foot lysimeter and wanted a foot of soil on top. So the three foot lysimeter had a two inch reservoir. So this is where water would accumulate whenever it leached through the soil. There was then a, and then there was a screen here that stopped any soil from moving down into the reservoir. So only water could make it down. There was then one foot of soil in a collector to kind of funnel the um, leachate water into the reservoir. And then there was one inch of soil on top of that lysimeter as well. So basically, in order for water to be collected as a part of this project and termed leachate, it had to leach through two feet of soil as well as the uh, turf grass lawn or the mulch bed that was still on top of the lysimeter as well. And we selected two feet because that's well past the rooting zone of most uh, lawns and shrubs. And so we kind of assume that anything that leaches through two feet is going to make it to the groundwater, most likely here in, in uh, the car sensitive area of Florida. So we went out to all these lysimeters about every week um, for two years. And every time we went out, we would pump out the water from that reservoir. So there's a little tube that we connect to the surface um, that allows us to pump out all of the water. You can see this is a sample that we collected. Um, you can see how clear the water is actually. That's because even though it has uh, leached through two feet of soil, that soil is really kind of almost filtering out any particles. And so nothing other than just clear water really makes its way into the lysimeter. So we measured how much volume leached in, so how much total water leached into our lysimeter, and then we collected samples to measure various nitrogen and phosphorus forms to get, a, to get an estimate of total nutrient leaching. And so without further ado, here's our results for year one. So what we're looking at here, this is a cumulative, uh, cumulative frequency plot or cumulative data plot, basically. Um, every time we went out and collected a sample, it would jump up if you got a sample. So by the end of the project, this is the total volume of leachate we had collected, but you can see the trajectories. Some were constantly high, some jumped up quickly, some were constantly low, et cetera. Uh, and red, the red lines are lysimeters under mulched beds. The blue lines are lysimeters under turf grass lawns. And this first plot is looking at total leachate volume. So uh, our lysimeters collected anywhere from zero. So there's one lysimeter that didn't collect a single sample to more than 25 liters of water leaching throughout the year. So that's a pretty substantial amount of variation. And you can also see there's no real obvious like red or blue pattern. There's some red values that are high, some blue values that are high. So that suggests there's not an obvious difference between mulch beds and lawns. We're also looking here at total nitrogen load. Um, and blue is the total nitrogen load from lawns and red is from uh, mulch beds. And again, 
maybe a little bit more blue up high, um, more red down low, but quite a bit of variability. I also want to point out the extreme uh, magnitude of these loads. So this is five pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet. This is our annual fertilizer recommendation on the high level for St. Augustine in Central Florida. We had three lysimeters that leached more than we would recommend fertilizing. So that's uh, pretty substantial. Total phosphorus is a similar story looking at um, a lot of variability, not a clear pattern between mulch beds and lawns. So another way we can look at this is just look at uh, box plots of all of these different patterns. Um, so we have total volume, ammonium, nitrate, total Keldahl nitrogen, organic nitrogen, total nitrogen, inorganic phosphorus and organic phosphorus. Basically what you're seeing is across all isometers, there's no obvious differences in nutrient loads between beds and lawns. The red box and the blue box overlap look pretty similar. I will say though, when we compared directly within landscapes. So when we paired a mulch bed with a lawn from the same home, the same residence to account for differences in like management practices, we did see that lawns leached more nitrate and total nitrogen. But we also know there's a lot of variability within these lawns and beds. And so we want to figure out what's controlling that leaching, what's, what's driving that variability. And so we looked at a bunch of different things. We looked at uh, socioeconomic statuses, status factors. We looked at soil chemistry. We looked at climate. Um, basically, what we found is that home age and property values were correlated with a bunch of different leaching parameters. So these socioeconomic status conditions are really what's driving uh, nutrient leaching in this first year of the study. Um, with newer homes leaching more, older homes leaching less, and then also uh, less expensive homes leaching less, more expensive homes leaching more. We don't know if that's because uh, newer, more expensive homes are more like, likely to irrigate more, they're more likely to fertilize more, they're more likely to have lower quality, quality soil because they haven't had the soil organic matter develop. We're not exactly sure, but definitely seems like there's something, some pattern there. We also found that phosphorus leaching was related to phosphorus in soils, but nitrogen was not. So to summarize, I'm just going to go through these quickly, but we had a lot of variability in nutrient leaching across Alachua County. Multiple sites leach more than our annual recommendations. And then it does appear lawns might leach a little bit more nitrogen than mulch beds, uh, but it's not really a, a really clear pattern. Um, and it might be driven more by socioeconomic factors than anything else. So that leads us to year two. I kind of already talked through the overall experimental design of this, but I'll remind you. So we continued working in the majority of lawns from year one. We had to replace two because of changes in ownership and the new owners wouldn't let us keep sampling, which was super annoying, but that's how it is. And then we added five homes that were high irrigators with reclaimed water. Um, so we found the top 100 irrigators in the county through the H2O SAVE program and then sent letters to them and found five high irrigators that would let us install a lysimeter. This is another picture of digging a hole. Um, so you can see how the turf grass is just a carpet and then you've got really sandy uh, soil. This property is about a year old, so it's very, very new landscape. Um, we also added three natural areas, like I mentioned, and I mentioned that we contracted with professional landscapers, the master's lawn care, to control nitrogen applied to our 12 lawns. Um, so these are our, our 12 or our four treatments, no nitrogen, synthetic fertilizer, organic fertilizer, and compost top dressing. And we told the masters, the group with the masters that was working with us, we said, I want you to, you develop your fertility program. You develop whatever you would recommend for these three different types for a residential landscape if there wasn't a fertilizer ordinance in place. So I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but just kind of a general idea of what we are applying. So heavy nitrogen in the summer every other month and then tapering off and then not much in the winter and then bringing it back for the spring. Um, same or similar story for organic fertilizer as well. So, so far, um, this is again, a cumulative distribution plot, but here we're looking at the averages of all of our different treatments. There's a lot of colors on here because there's a lot of treatments. And so it's hard to really take much away from this, if I'm being honest. Um, I just kind of like to show it because I like these figures. 
but in general, you see for total leaching volume, our uh, natural areas, which is this like kind of teal color, are the lowest. But we also had um, our organic yards had really low leaching volume. Total phosphorus load was actually highest in our control yards. Um, ammonium, there was one site that leached a heck of a lot of ammonium in one sampling date. But then organic nitrogen, nitrate, and total nitrogen kind of all tell a pretty similar story with the synthetic fertilizer lawns really leaching a substantial amount more than the majority of the other treatments. There's a lot of variability um, across treatments. And also I would point you to the axes. So this highest value for nitrate was four pounds per thousand square feet. The highest value for organic was about 1.5. Highest value for ammonium was about one. And so nitrate is the thing that we're most concerned with but organic N is still contributing a substantial amount. So this is again, another way to look at the data. We're looking at all of the treatments. Um, there's a lot, don't try to take it all in right now because I'll tell you the most important points. Um, but overall, there's not a ton of statistical differences because of high variability. But what we do see is yards, uh, lawns appear to leach more than natural areas, except for maybe this one organic treatment, and I'm not sure what's going on with that. But overall, all of our lawn treatments had more nutrient or more water leaching than natural areas. The nitrate leaching was generally highest, or nitrogen leaching was generally highest in fertilized areas, fertilized treatments, and then organic treatments, so that's the biosolids based fertilizer and then compost, then control. So it's kind of, that's the ranking of the most nutrient, most potential nutrient impacts. And synthetic and organic treatments leach 92 and 52 times as much nitrogen as natural areas. So those are pretty substantial numbers. There's also no obvious difference in phosphorus leaching controls. One control lawn did leach a lot of phosphorus. I think that's just some weird thing with the soil underlying that lawn. So those are kind of the main takeaways right now. It's still not a, um, not a silver bullet or anything like that, but it does appear that these fertilizer treatments, even if they're being applied by a professional, um, when you're applying them to real world landscapes, this nutrient application can lead to increases in nitrogen leaching. So to summarize that again, Oh, this is actually the same summary slide as before, sorry. So I guess that's actually all I've got. Um, I'm happy to go back through any slides or anything. I just wanted to wrap up so we made sure we had plenty of time for questions, but I will uh, unshare my screen, I guess, and then we can go back to questions. Uh, thanks a lot for your attention, I appreciate it. Hey, Jay, thank you so much. We do have a, a few questions. You covered a lot of stuff. Uh, in, yeah, in the last sorry. Five minutes or more so. than, um, more but, than I know. Uh, go kind of go back early on. Uh, one of the questions was what work is being done to displace chemicals with biologicals? Um, they're thinking with the, you know, the whole principles of symbiosis. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, I talked about compost in the second half of the presentation. Compost is a big part of the story of the biological treatment story. Um, we worked with compost top dressing, so using actual compost material that looks like really rich organic soil. And that brings in nutrients, but it also brings in a really healthy soil micro microbiome that will enhance internal nutrient cycling, um, reducing fertilizer needs, but it also has been shown to increase pest resistance of very, and nematode suppression. Um, different composts have different properties, but some can do that. There's also been interest in taking the compost and kind of making a compost tea. Um, I haven't worked with compost teas, but I've had people ask me about them. Um, and so that will take all of that organic rich soil out of the story and will just basically you would spray the bacterial community, the beneficial microbes onto your landscape to, to have those benefits without having to um, worry about the potential nutrient or organic issues that you might find. Very cool. Um, how do you know that uh, ordinances are being followed? Yeah, you don't. Um, I think what I, I think I talked about that a little bit, and I I feel for landscape professionals because you all 
follow the ordinances and you have to because you have to do that because if you get caught breaking an ordinance you're going to lose a license or lose your job right um and so i think that landscape professionals do generally do a good job of being educated and following those ordinances so i applaud you on that but then i feel for you when um you might apply some fertilizer at the right rate at the right place the right time and then two weeks later you'll go back and the resident has gone and reapplied on top of what you did because they didn't think it was green enough um not saying that happens all the time but definitely happens there's little regulation there's not a ton of awareness even of these ordinances um, and i think that's something that we could really do a lot better job of with homeowners great um how did you come up with the idea that traditional fertilizer applications occurred every two months? That was not my idea. That was the recommendation of the landscapers. I said, I literally said, okay, we've got a year to do this project. Give me a one year fertility program that you would do if there wasn't an ordinance. And so that's what they came up with. Um, I'm sure that if they were working with a, a regular clients in the real world, they would probably tailor it more specifically to that client, but that was just their recommendation. Okay. Um, was the synthetic fertilizer applied in a slow release form in the study? I would have to look back. I, I would have to look back at the formulations. They used a variety of different products. Um, and so I would imagine that uh, actually, I don't know. I, I can't answer that. I, I don't even want to speculate. Um, that's a good question. I should know the answer to that. And I have that information. I just don't know it off the top of my head. Okay. Um, how can we better educate the public and our clients um, about this problem? And, you know, when they're bombarded with fertilizer ad advertisements, talking about weed and feeds and other, you know, old school recommendations, um, what can we, you know, how can we better educate folks? And that's yeah. certainly not yeah. Well, they, I mean, if I knew the answer to that, uh, Tom, well, Tom probably has a better answer to that than I do. But um, I think you need to, well, part of it is that there still isn't a ton of really solid data out there um, directly linking like fertilizer to water quality. Like it's a known thing, but there aren't the empirical studies. So the other side argument can poke holes in it. Um, and I think like from either perspective, I don't know, I think we need more empirical research. We need, which I'm a scientist, so of course I'm gonna say that, but we also need to just kind of make sure we're educating the professionals, trying to reach homeowners, but then also like if the professionals can educate their clients a little bit or maybe partnerships between extension county government to develop the educational materials to hand off to the professionals to then drop off like i don't know i i this is more of an ffl question than a me question i think but um we can do flip my florida yard with tom and talk about or talk about some of these issues on radio reach the people where they are digesting the information um and i think getting the information and, and showing the impacts is important to be able to then make that message more more strong to strengthen that message, I guess, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of that comes down to doing a lot more of what we're already doing in many cases. Um, you know, our, the landscape professionals out there are doing a lot to educate their clients. Um, we just have to keep getting the word out. Extension is doing work, you know, it, we have to just keep trying to get the word out. And as you say, um, we're doing things through some non-traditional means, some television and radio now, trying to reach different audiences than the traditional extension audience. And so um, we're working towards that, but th there's certainly a lot more of everything we're already doing that needs to be done. Great. Um, what, what are your thoughts about putting signs in um, retail establishments, helping to educate people about ordinances and, um, and the problems? Yeah, that's a good question. That's a tricky question for me to answer. Um, because as a state employee, I'm uh, not allowed to have a regulatory opinion, I guess I should say. But I do think that, so I know, and I saw Holly Greer had mentioned this in the chat as well. Um, Alachua County does have a requirement for signage in anywhere that there is fertilizer being sold. And 
So I guess that doesn't that doesn't go against any state requirements either, obviously. So I think like I think if we can educate people at the point of sell sale, that's a great place to do it. Um, I don't know how effective those might be. Holly might have some idea or Stacy or somebody, but um, I think that's that's one approach to raise awareness. Um, yeah, but then also like, sorry, now that now that I'm thinking a little more about it. I, I don't I don't know the answer to this entirely, but I just had I just tried to reseed my backyard, right? So I had a bunch of a bunch of pest issues, and then I didn't want to replace everything with sod, and so I, I got some seed centipede grass seed just off of Amazon, and like I don't know, can you get fer I think you can get fertilizer and weed and feed and things like that off of Amazon too. I don't know about fertilizer, but like I don't know if how many people are even going to the brick and mortar stores anymore versus purchasing online. So that's another thing that will probably have to be dealt with moving forward. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, you know, I'm I'm more the traditionalist or, you know, if I need to go purchase something, I usually go buy it. But I even now I'm buying more and more off of Amazon. I haven't bought yeah. ever bought fertilizer or anything, but certainly it's it's something that I'm sure can be purchased yeah. uh, through mail order. So um, that's that's an interesting point. Um, Let's see. Uh, one person's asking. So, some professionals apply fertilizer on top of mulch. No. So that that I probably didn't do a good job of explaining that. We were um, the mulch bed areas of that first study. There was not fertilizer being applied there, or at least as well as I know. There might have been some being like the mulch was near shrubs, shrubbed areas, and trees and things, depending on the yard. But that was kind of supposed to be almost like a control for that landscape, right? So it's still an urban area, still the same soil type, the same landscape, probably a similar irrigation approach if you have shrubs in there, but no nutrients being applied. Um, and so the lack of a difference between mulch beds and lawns suggests that lawns aren't really the problem necessarily. It's kind of a bigger management issue. Okay. Is there a concept for right plant for the right place and right microbiome? Probably. <laughs> um, I think that the, the microbiome, the, there's microbiome is a very like popular hip thing to focus on in science. And I think rightfully so, because now we have the tools to study and we know how important it is in a wide variety of applications. Like we know the human gut microbiome is important for your health and your digestion, right? We know that the, I mean, I have a friend who studies hippos in Africa and he studies the hippo microbiome and their gut microbiome. We know, but we know that the soil microbiome contributes a bunch of different things to the environment. And the tricky thing though, is there are so many different microbes out there that like, and many of which we can't even identify or we don't even know about that. I don't know that you could really control that microbiome as well as you might want to. You could probably, you can enhance it, but I don't know. That's, that's probably one of the underlying causes of a lot of issues we see, but we just might not know how to deal with it. Um, interesting question. Have we tested more natural Florida lawns versus turf lawns? Um, I'm not sure what is meant by natural yeah. Florida lawns. I guess they mean collection of weeds or yeah if somebody could if whoever asked that question could clarify um our control i will say our control lawns were actually all all of our lawns in the study we intentionally chose we worked with holly from alachua county to identify volunteers across a wide range of like landscape uh preferences i guess i would say so going from really high-end, expensive houses with super nice yards that you could tell they were probably out there with, a, with the scissors cutting the grass every day, right? Versus, um, I mean, I'll be honest, my yard is one of the control yards and I haven't applied, I've lived here for five years now and I, I irrigate when it's looking like it needs it. And it's a St. Augustine yard, but like St. Augustine plus a bunch of other stuff, right? And so, the, we also have natural areas in our second part of the study, and those were mostly like wooded conservation areas, um, nature trails, that sort of thing. 
Um, and those didn't leach much at all, but I'm not sure what you mean by a natural Florida yard. Okay. During uh, the study periods, how did you account for rainfall in the results? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we, I guess, uh, long story short, we didn't or we haven't. Um, we, we know that like rainfall is going to match up really tightly with how much leaching is occurring. That's very clear. Like it doesn't, we go out every week to, to collect samples, but most of the time there isn't a ton of samples out there, especially from, I think from November through early March until it started raining a ton here in Gainesville. We got maybe one sample out of probably like 300 potential opportunities, right? And so we account for rainfall or the lack thereof just by not having a sample. But I do think that we're going to look into um, the, the timing of rainfall and the different locations because like we all of our houses are, all of our locations are in Gainesville um, on the west side of town, but like in the summer, there can be like patches of storms here that might not hit there, et cetera, et cetera. And so it could be that a certain house just got a lot more rain in one week than another. And so that's why it leached more. Um, but we didn't care as much about that for the study because we just wanted to, like, we wanted to embrace that variability and see like, okay, we've got a bunch of different types of houses here. What's, what's the, the possible range for leaching and what's the average and then what are we doing? And, and then the county and we've talked to some folks from DEP as well about this work can like take these results and say like, okay, how much of a problem is this really now that we have this actual real world data? Were any of the lawns um, adjacent to or, you know, next to a golf course? Yeah, I saw that question. Um, not that I can think of. We had a couple of lawns in gated communities with or private communities with golf courses, but the homes weren't necessarily like associated with the golf course by any means. Um, I've been interested in working with golf courses, but I haven't in the past. So I think it's, okay. it's an interesting thing to pursue though. And, you know, one to kind of wrap things up, you know, what do you hope will be the end result of this research? Um, yeah. What, uh, no, what do you hope, question. you know, happens here? Yeah, it's, so the ultimate end goal, hope of this, of this research and of my career is that we have less nutrients in our surface waters that leads to a reduction in algal blooms and improvement in biodiversity and freshwater ecosystems. That's like, that's the career goal. That's the big picture goal, right? Um, for this research in particular, I would say, I hope that we provide an empirically sound set of data that can be used by regulators to decide how to get to that goal. Um, so I went into this saying, I don't really know if fertilizer is gonna be an issue or not because we see that it doesn't seem to leach if you apply a ton from some test blocks, right? From this study, it seems like it might be a concern. Um, and so I think like, I think that the end goal is that we become a little more judicious and more careful with what we use in the landscape, but also try to come up with alternatives to, because I don't want people to have to get rid of their yards. I'm, I have a lawn. I'd like people to have lawns if they want them, but maybe there's alternative ways to keep that lawn looking good enough for you. Okay. And the, the second half of that question was how long do you think, you know, it's going to take for this information? <laughs> um, there's certainly yeah. no way we can, determine that is just keep studying, keep, you know, mm -hmm. keep getting more data points and more yeah. information, as you say, for, you know, some of our folks to be able to make uh, decisions from there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I will say, so I talked a little bit about that Lake Watch big picture study that showed changes in water quality trends that hopefully will be published in the next three or four months. And like, once that gets published, I'm going to be sending it out to county officials, state officials that I know, because I think it is one of the first empirical uh, pieces of information that we have on this issue. And the project, the, the fertilizer project that we're working on now, we're gonna be finishing up sampling this month and final report is due to the county and later in the summer. 
And then after that, we'll be working on writing it up for a publication to share with folks. So um, more to come soon within the next year or two. And certainly, you know, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program has lots of things to help, um, you know, if we can make sure that we're following those principles, not only fertilizing responsibly, but also looking at protecting our waterfront and reducing stormwater runoff. There's, there's a lot of pieces to this pie. And, um, you know, we've got some, some different things that can help. Um, everybody, don't forget that uh, there is uh, a survey. Make sure that uh, you take a few minutes to uh, complete that survey. Uh, it really helps us determine, you know, the effectiveness of these webinars and also what we should be teaching next year. And uh, also, please don't forget to join us June 14th for our next uh, webinar with Dr. Adam Dale talking about new landscape pests. With that, AJ, thank you so much for uh, giving us such great information and look forward to having you again. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Take care. Have a great day. Yep. Bye.